Welcome to Alex and Annie, the real women of Vacation Rentals. I'm Alex. And I'm Annie. And we are joined today with the Darm Battleground Baddies. We've got a whole crew today. We've got Travis Wilburn, CJ Stam, and Julie Bird joining us, who were the judges of the most recent Darm Conference Battleground of Technology Providers. Welcome to the show, everybody. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. So, hey, nice, nice hat, Travis. Hey, buddy, I, you you look good. I think we're going to cause a little bit of confusion. I hope. Yeah, <laughs> someone's going to call with? you, CJ, and you, Travis. So, speaking yeah. of which, um, why don't we make sure that our guests know who everybody is, starting with the lovely lady Julie? Tell us a little about about your company and yourself, and then we'll go around the rest of the crew. Great. Yeah, I am the president of CaboVillas.com, and we represent over 150 properties in the Los Cabos region. We are a part of Nocturne Luxury Villas, which is our parent company, and we have locations under the Nocturne umbrella in several different key markets that we try to go to places that have a heavy traffic of private jets. Sounds like good places. <laughs> I've been with company for 22 years and um, that was my first DARM and my first battleground. And it was a really good opportunity to learn more about what's going on in the industry. Great. Travis? I'm Travis Wilburn, the founder of State Charlottesville, which is a tourism hospitality group in Charlottesville, Virginia, which is a vacation rental company event venue and a couple of other things. And then also started a thing called the Hunter Collection that has um, some of the best people and properties from all over North America, professional vacation rental managers and a little brand and loyalty project that we've created. <laughs> So, Hunter Collection leads us over to CJ, who's I wearing like the hat. Who's wearing the hat? <laughs> I am a proud member of the Hunter Collection. Thank you, Travis, for putting that together, too. Uh, CJ Stam, Southern Comfort Cabin Rentals, Blue Ridge, Georgia. We manage about 200 homes there. I've uh, been in the vacation rental space since 2006. Uh, started with acquisition of two homes and just kind of grew from there. Started managing some of the houses next door. Turned into a vacation rental company, turned into buying a company, turned into building homes, turned into a real estate company. I'm full circle right back to just management and having a really good time. Oh, that's great. <laughs> well, I think between the three of you, just an incredible wealth of knowledge and experience in this industry. So it makes sense why you would be the judges. You're using a lot of the technology and, and know quite a bit about it. But before we get started, we're going to go through the list. Just if anybody was not at Darm or didn't see the battleground of who was part of this competition, it was AI Adaptive, Air DNA, Beyond, Guesty, Key Data, Price Labs, Rentals, Top Key, Ventori, and Wheelhouse. And Key Data was the one that won. And I believe all three of you had Key Data in your top three. And that's how the judging was done. Curious to know, what, what was it about Key Data that you all agreed was worthy of being in that top three? Yeah, for me, it was the use of that dashboard that they're um, developing. I don't think it's in process yet. We're not using it yet. But the ease of being able to see your data all in one screen instead of poking around from report to report, it's a heavily used system for my company. And you know, having the additional tools of being able to look at stats at the same time really is a game changer for us. I look at it from a lens of what property managers really need if it's not already in their tool belt. You know, the construction worker doesn't show up without a hammer and what's going to be the next hammer. I think one of the things that always slightly puzzles me is how tough it is to actually take an internal look at your data to understand what's going on. A lot of companies, I mean, we got to remember 17,000 vacation rental management companies in the U.S. alone. They don't have a great vision into what's actually going on. They're just, you know, receiving reservations from here or there. But I think if you, you've you got a great platform, a great booking engine, this is a, a tool that would be the, the hammer that you would need to add. And so that's why it was an easy number one for me. Part of my judging process is always kind of what Travis just said. What is the company presenting that is not just a feature enhancement, but it's also something that the manager can put to use immediately that's going to make sense. It's actually going to help them. I'm a big bandwidth guy. I like to think of things, what's going to help me buy some time back, either myself or someone on my team. That's the only way you're going to scale or become more profitable. And if you're either one of those things, you're typically going to be better for your customer. And with Key Data Dashboard, we were already looking at data rails to see if we could pull this kind of information from multiple places. So when they presented something that was already in our stack, like we use Key Data Dashboard every day, 
if you're going to give me something that I would be going somewhere else to get, but you're going to put it in something I'm already using, now that's a feature enhancement I can apply immediately, just like both of them. I did actually get a notification. I will say that beta is about to launch. So that's great. Very excited to get in there. The thing that really got me, and I'm excited to, to actually see this in the wild, is that we're <laughs> going to be able to pull like a Google Sheet or an Excel form and other types of data from outside of key data into a single dashboard when you log in. So you'll be able to take your most favorite reports from key data plus a couple reports from outside of key data and have it all in one place instead of toggling between two. So from an executive or a management level, that's going to be a pretty much a no brainer. What sort of reports would you pull in or what, what, what um, platforms are you pulling other reports in from? Great question. We have a forecast revenue algorithm that we use in Excel as an example. And mm -hmm. I would love to be able to see that. Um, we also have a little bit different pacing model that we use outside of key data. I would love to see that pulled in. Once we get in there, I'm sure there will be other things that are possibly in the PMS, several PMSs that you log into right now that have kind of a neat three or four screens that are presenting some data from inside the PMS. If you could also put that into key data, that would be great. So we're, we're really excited to see what it will do once it's in the wild. One thing I want to add to that is, you know, insights from maybe your revenue system, you know, any dynamic pricing system, because key data, once you've got enough property managers plugged into it, when you look at your benchmarks and your, your comp sets, you're competing against, you're looking at what the market trends are for professionally managed properties, but you aren't able to pull in like um, what the OTAs are doing and what their occupancy levels are. And that you can pull from like a beyond pricing or another um, pricing tool. I was going to ask, ask you about that, Julie. Market like Cabo being international, I know key data hasn't had the data points and they haven't had a lot of participation in the international market, but do you feel like they've got enough penetration right now to be able to give you enough data points that you can complement with, again, Wheelhouse or Beyond or one of the other pricing tools? Absolutely. But it took an effort on my part to get the other companies to get on board with key data. And I really did a big campaign on that and got a lot of property managers to join into key data so that we could have good reporting. Yeah. I'm just glad that I spoke before CJ and or in between. So it's like you got the smart people on that one. Um, and uh, no, I mean, it's it's a tool built for professionals and it's, I mean, it's one of the cleanest data sources out there right now. And so yeah. I think it's an easy one for us to support as a group for sure. Just to set the scene for our listeners that maybe haven't been to Darm or haven't seen one of the battlegrounds. I mean, these companies, when they get up there, it, it's a little nerve wracking, right? I mean, they've got you three there and I've seen some other judges in the past. You know, Travis, you've always been part of it. Were you part of it last year too? CJ? Five years, I think. Both CJ of you been five years? Sure. Wow. Yeah, yeah, both of us have had the privilege of, of doing this for five years. And it's been fun wow. to go through the, the progression. I would hate to be on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's true. I would too. We've seen some very awkward ones <laughs> in the yeah. past uh, before. I've watched several of the, the presenters, the same ones year over year over year, that have steadily improved. Mm -hmm. And there's some that have just, you know, one hit wonder. We've had a couple yeah. of those too. Did you all coordinate before going up on stage and taking the chairs on, on the questions that you were going to ask? Or is it just in the moment what hit you and using your industry knowledge to dissect the presentation that was shown? It's funny. This year, it was all professional companies presenting. And by professional, I mean companies that have been in our market, I think, for we, – they're all known – Companies. Well, adaptive, Last adaptive was new. Adaptive was one yeah. of the newer ones. Was that the but, only new one this year? I think top. Oh, top, top key. key was yeah. Yeah, top key. Yeah, they both of those guys though, have been around for a year and a half or so, and been kind of going to the yeah. conferences and what have you and you but last year my point is you know we saw some presentations where it was definitely a lot of one-hit wonders and they were making big claims and we want to make sure that you know, I, I think it's only five minutes that they're allowed to present yeah. so it's mm -hmm. pretty tough to try to present your entire company in five minutes or whatever it might be and yeah. so we last year we did a lot more research this year it was a conversation afterwards and watching you know just solely based off of the presentations but I mean there's definitely some fun moments in there for I think for everybody. Yeah, very, very much like a Shark Tank kind of environment, <laughs> I would say. It's nice that there's also a People's Choice Award as well. The audience is invested in 
and going and hearing everybody out. And it's almost like a lot of the times when I'm up there, you get energy off the crowd. You can tell when someone's like into something, if you're going, if you're starting to ask the right line of questions. Um, I often find myself looking out on the audience to see if they're really getting engaged with what we're doing or if it's just, you know, snooze, snooze time out there. You know, and you guys brought this up a little bit earlier is just in your reverse of Dharm, but you know, one of the things that I think is always humbling and sur- surprising is Amy Haida puts on one of the greatest conferences with the Absolutely. most professional managers there. Yeah. And so you have people that you might have not ever met, but you've been following on LinkedIn. But I mean, just the quality of people, it's like executive summit times, you know, it's five at six at and I mean, it's great, but it's a little nerve wracking on our side too, because it's like trying to sound smart with all these incredible <laughs> people in one room. I'm like, great. Make it till you make it, Travis. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Try really hard. That was kind of the reason why with like top key that I didn't put that in my top three is because I believe that that system could be really good for somebody who's just starting out or doesn't know how to have a sweep account or doesn't know things in the industry that most people that are at Darm would have already known, you know, kind mm-hmm. of just the level of property managers that were there. Yeah. So maybe there needs to be two categories, like maybe one for like the people coming in, just starting out or like the the professionalized ones. But I think, um, Travis, I asked you off, off camera and kind of this goes to Julie and CJ, right after COVID, that was when we saw like the biggest influx of new providers, new technology and, and advancement. And one of the things I think I feel like we could all agree on is that there's been more advancement within the vacation rental space than there has been in the hotel space in probably 20 years. I mean, some of the places are still using their technology from the 80s and haven't really adapted mm-hmm. much because it's just such a big infrastructure in the hotel world. But do you think that there's a slowdown in the amount of technology that's being offered or that the technology is just being more dialed in on specific skill sets, topics, areas, instead of just being broadly across you know, like the, the entire ecosystem of vacation rental? In short, yes. I think the traditional softwares that we see, the guides, the guest view guides or what have you, we're going to see a lot of slowdown on mm-hmm. that front. But you see a lot of optimization on these larger companies that are independently owned right now. Try not to say anything to hurt anybody's feelings, but some of the private equity groups are more worried about bottom lines right now than anything else. So there's also a slowdown on that front. But you do see a lot of private companies that are either going to emerge or better themselves by all means. And I, I think it's going to be a race to the finish and that's fun. But that also being said, I think you know AI adaptive is at the forefront by all means, but I've watched a lot of companies jump on the AI front in the last eight months. And I think that's going to be really interesting to see probably this coming year, hopefully at Darm, if there is one. Let's hope that there is one, Amy High Note. Uh, mm-hmm. We all love it. But uh, it would be amazing to see how many AI companies are out there doing some solutions to, to make our lives easier. And so I think you'll see a lot of investment on that front this coming year. Yeah, absolutely. And Julie, on AI Adaptive, I think you're the only one of the three that is currently using it, but it is interesting to hear what they've done and would love if you could just share a little bit about your experience so far in using that on your website. Yeah, I mean, we just, um, we went live last week, which is a portion of it. You kind of have to drip it out a little bit because it takes a little coding on your website to make it work properly. We haven't been able to really see the results yet, um, Um, Although we are seeing an increase in our online reservations on our direct website over the last week, um, what they do is they do a a test group. So half of the traffic that comes into your site will see your site the way it was before. And then half of them will see it with the recommended properties. We've got it right now on our homepage and on each of the property pages to recommend based on the AI that Adaptive is powering. We'll be able to see the control group versus um, the not control group to see how the conversions are. And um, how the results were to compare the two to be able to see the value of the AI driven um, recommendations. I will say that, I mean, more than double the amount of reservations that we've had in the past week on our own direct website than we had last year um, for the same exact week. Um, And that is saying a lot when we see that our web traffic is down from that time period. So we're hopeful that this is going to be a really good return for us. And is that comparing the 50% to the other 50% that 
the one that has it is doubled bookings or no, all of we haven't doubled. been able to see that yet because they don't have enough data to present that to us. We'll see that in a month. Once they have, once they have a full month's worth of data, they'll present to yeah. us um, what the control group, the conversions and the results were um, versus, you know, the other. We haven't even deployed all of it. We're about not even halfway there in what we want to put on our website. Um, but, you know, I, I would say that's probably going to be there within the next 30 days. They'll be recommending the properties on the search results, which takes a little bit more work to get that done. And we're just now putting it on our emails so we can focus on our emails a little bit more about the destination instead of focusing on a specific property that the customer may or may not be interested in. And then we have the adaptive put in the recommendations for specifically our, our past guests because we really know a lot about them when we're doing email marketing to them. But for guests that haven't stayed with us before, they can do the, you know, on the emails, it can't really pull the same AI as it could on a web browser, but we're able to do like popularity or most book villas or um, things that maybe would get the client's attention um, in that email. So there's a lot still coming um, and I'll be able to report back in a couple of months of how you know, it's going for us. It has gone very well for our sister companies. Um, we've got two of our other companies that are using it currently, and they are seeing some good results every time the control group dip performs better. I love that they rolled it out as a control group also that whenever we did anything of, you know, certain amount of significance on our website at Condo World, we always did that exact same thing. And it's, it's such a better way to actually, you know, make changes like that because, you know, small things, probably not, but I just feel like, you know, a lot of cases when somebody launches something new, it's like, it's just the whole new and now you can't go back and you don't know if it's really working or not. And not that you would discontinue using it, but it's it just, just to get everybody ownership and understanding the value. It's great to be able to show that data. Yeah, absolutely. We've been impressed with what we've seen from the other companies. We'll be back in just a minute after a word from our premier brand sponsor, Turno. I'm Kanan Whited, and I've been a Turno user for about two years, and I have uh, placed Turno and Marketplace Cleaners through hundreds of properties um, throughout three or four states across the country. I, I'd worked with cleaners for years, but I couldn't find cleaners that would understand the urgency that I wanted to have on damages. Um, so cleaners would tell me that sheets were stained and needed to be replaced like two weeks after guests would be there, you know, like finally when they would get around to doing the laundry. And by then I would have had already, you know, rated the guests five stars. And so they had a great stay um, and that they were a great guests. And, and meanwhile, they, they weren't. And the cleaners that, um, that I found on Turno have been just remarkable. The Turno marketplace is full of these amazing cleaning companies that have so much um, capabilities and accountability and, and they do just a really, really great job. The first time I used Turno, I was set up with a cleaner and his team. And I came in and I trained them all on how to do the listings. Then the next day they, they didn't show up. But because I was on Turno, it was okay because Turno knew that they weren't going to show up and they pulled in another cleaning company. Turno customer support is it's like a huge team. There's literally hundreds of them. It's, it's massive. Everybody is just like a, a great team um, over there. They, the customer service is really skilled in understanding the back end of Turno. What I appreciate a lot about the Turno customer service is that when you tell them when you're having trouble with something, they don't they don't just write you back and tell you like step by step how to do it. Like they write you back and say, I did that for you. And if you want to do it yourself next time, this is how you do it. Through the automation that's available in the Turno app, I have been able to streamline and automate so much of my Airbnb business. The activities that you can handle and the automations that you can handle inside of Turno really do automate so much of the cleaning process, which um, has helped me save so much money and increase revenue. Our industry is so picturesque. We got to have phenomenal photos. Why aren't we serving up the photos that need to be delivered to that right person? And understanding that is exactly what AI Adaptive has done. So, 
just for your listeners, if you want to look at it, if you go to kabavillas.com and just look at Google Chrome, type it in and see the recommended just for you, that's AI adaptive. And if you go into incognito, that's what it would look like as the non-control group, right, Julie? Probably, yes. Yeah, and so, it's. I mean, it's, it's pretty fun to watch. So Travis, from, from the 100 collection perspective, did you look at any of this technology and think, okay, I would like to partner with them from 100 Collection high level and get that out to all the members? Absolutely. I've started a company called Adaptive AI. And <laughs> okay. uh, no, what they're doing is very necessary and we are very closely paying attention to AI and how to um, apply that to our partners' websites. I mean, we're very just concentrated on who our partners are and how we can serve them. But I would argue that implementing a version of AI is quite necessary for the future of your business and also to optimize the people that you have on staff and to what Joyce said. I mean, it's 100%. It's delivering a better product to your guests, which is who we all serve. Yeah, I think in any of the conversations that we've had recently with PMS CEOs, we had um, Guesty and hostfully Margot mm-hmm. and Barrett on the show recently. You know, the biggest things that they're talking about right now is how they're infusing AI within the software. I'm curious, I mean, Guesty was on that list. Was that what they presented? Was it the AI component? Do you remember? I think what they presented was tool, yeah. uh, oh, okay. within, their, within their platform, um, their software. And, you know, I mean, for me, that was just not even in the running because there are specific companies that are there for pulling data and that's what their expertise is in the revenue management side of things. We use Beyond Pricing um, and I think that their algorithms have been around a long time and they're really able to do a good job at predicting pricing. So Guesty was rolling that out, but I would say stay in your lane. Well, and I, <laughs> yeah. I, want to dub, I want to dovetail into that because we saw that with the RevMax with Streamline and there's a big difference here. What Guesty built, I thought was phenomenal. I mean, it really was a very slick tool. They're, they're, the person from Guesty that presented did a very good job. The challenge is, is it couldn't be for everybody. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. But from an actual, if I were a Guesty user or I was considering Guesty, that would have been something that probably, A, if I was on it, I'd say, I want to use this. Or B, if I was considering Guesty, I would want to know more about it in my valuation of that product. So. Right. Mm-hmm. Which leads me to a question. I'm glad you brought this point up um, or <laughs> reference the all-in-one systems. One of the things mm-hmm. that we're seeing is, and in talking with the PMSs is a lot of people are trying to be all things to everybody. And I just, I don't know how that's, I just don't know how that is a, is a good way to write with problems. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> Travis and CJ have an opinion here. <laughs> Too many people are becoming these closed ecosystems where they say they have the, the best products. Right. For your listeners, here's what you need to ask. Ask how many developers each group has. Find out who they are. How are they resourced? Do they have enough resources? Um, there's a lot of these things. We see these like shiny objects, right? But imagine if Elon just built a Tesla and they said, hey, good luck. Uh, but you, nobody knew how to change the tire. And that's actually what's happening in a lot of different companies right now. Uh, and so when you have this closed ecosystem and you also have this thing called profit that you need to make, they're going to pull back and we're seeing more and more on those things break. And so what I would tell you and what I would argue for, I've yet to see a company that has a a closed ecosystem where I would want every single piece of it, the all in one, let us figure out what our hub is, which is your property management system and let us attach our spokes the way that we see fit, whether that's credit card processing, home management, reservation, CRM, open it up. I mean, I just, I can add a lot more, but, uh, Julie or CJ. <laughs> it's, it's a hot topic. It deserves a whole different panel. <laughs> it really could be a show. No, yeah. I, I'm glad right. you, I'm glad you're passionate about it. Julie? Well, you know, we use Track um, TravelNet Solutions, and we're seeing a lot of that happening um, within TravelNet Solutions. And we haven't gone with um, all of their tools that they've added to it. We still stay with our plugins because we find them to be more effective. So, I mean, they can offer it. I I think it's really a a matter of giving you a choice in it of whether or not you have to pay for it is really imperative. And, um, you know, the distribution engine got rolled out, um, which is basically taking over the channel manager within the travel net solutions echo space but it's still a work in progress and you know the support like what what travis was saying is that you know how many people are behind it in the support and and how can you make changes when you see 
bugs and problems and how do those get fixed and how much time does it take um, that, you know, people get stretched very thin. And when you are putting it all in one basket, you, you know, that, that you feel that a lot um, when you're trying to solve issues. Yeah. And I think the prioritization of what, you know, what's on fire that needs to be put out is is what ends up happening when you've got that many layers of technology. And I, I go back to um, an interview we did with Lino Maldonado, and he talked about kind of your like, you know, leaning tower of tech. There's all these pieces. <laughs> and, and I mean, that's a really great way to put it because there's just all these pieces. And again, if everybody's not aligned and you have the same resources to deploy to each component of it equally whenever there's a problem, one thing is going to lean and that's a, that Jenga piece falls out and the entire system just crashes. Um, but CJ, you have an opinion and I'm really curious to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so Travis used the term walled garden and I kind of want to go back to the, the previous question before the AI on, you know, what we're seeing in the space, more people or less people. And there's two terms you, you, we hear a lot, right? A company wants to build a moat, right? They want to they want to build their their technology in such a way that it's hard for other people to catch up to them, right? And then you also hear the term walled garden, right? And from a property management standpoint, when you think of a walled garden, you want to think of a safe place inside the walls. Unfortunately, some of these companies are reversing that. They are trying to trap people inside their crappy software. Mm -hmm. They are suing yeah, people. They yeah. are threatening. They are threatening them if they don't like the service that they're getting. Too bad you signed a contract. That's wrong, that's, right? Yeah. And what that's going totally to agree. do is it it will shrink their moat, right? Yeah. Kind and of when the people from the people from the inside will start busting down those walls, they're going to want to run from it. And it's a very, very unfortunate thing and unfortunate and it is unfortunate that it's driven by outside forces that do not know our space. They are foreigners mm -hmm. and they're not even trying to get to know us. Right. Yeah. So that is that is sad. It's upsetting to me because I'm hearing from people all over the place what's happening to them. And it's not cool. It's not it's, cool at all. It's so and bad. right? Now. What's going to happen, yeah. though, is that kind of activity is the opportunity that we yeah. thought was going away, right? We mm -hmm. thought, okay, we've got these big guys. They're all moated up. They're all protected. They're building these all in ones. Everybody's going to be happy. And the walls are falling in and the moats are drying up. I tell you what I think we're going to see is a huge influx of opportunity mm -hmm. for some of these smaller guys to come in and be super good at best in class. And the next PMS system that will be the best is the one that's going to have that really robust core for reservations and financial accounting, and that allows us to bolt on the things that work the best. Or the guy that has so much gunpowder and so many developers that they can actually build to a best-in-class yeah. all-in-one. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. and they're yeah. and that yeah. and that that are cool. That aren't yeah. going to be like if you don't like that one feature that we signed you up for, we should let you out. I yeah, mean, how exactly. A, how is a, how's a homeowner in my program going to feel if I'm like, no, you can't leave? I I was just thinking right. the same thing. I was going to ask you that because, I mean, you think about it, like I, I definitely prefer the PMSs that are the modular based. You pay for what you actually want to use in right. it, not for the whole kit and caboodle that you're only using a portion of it. But when you first sign on, you think all of, you need all of it and then you realize you don't. But mm -hmm. the contract terms, and it's not just software, there's other providers within the space is ludicrous in a lot of cases that if they're not doing a good job and you can't get out of it. I mean, if that was going to be my question, if you guys had a homeowner that was just completely upset about what, being on your program, you're not going to keep them in it. Right. I mean, it's like, if you're not happy, leave. Yeah, I mean, okay, right. Yeah. Or, or even they <laughs> might love, they might love certain parts of what we do, right. but sure. Not I've done, lo I've done lawn care and I've done lawn yeah. care bad. Yeah. We'll let the homeowner out of our lawn care program to go right. get their, an individual to do it or trash collection. We are no different than these software providers. It's just a, it's just a different class of service, right? Yeah. Is it, it's, isn't it's it ironic though? Somewhere in the, in the manufacturing Ooh. line, right? Yeah. And it, I think it's ironic that, you know, as an industry, we talk about the individuality of, you know, every manager operates differently. Every market operates differently. But then here we have the technology coming in and saying, well, we can handle Cabo the same way we can handle Georgia mountains, yeah, the same way we can handle white. New York city. And yeah. it's not. And so like, again, so like to the point of, if you have a revenue management system, if they can't get the data sources that are going to be relevant to your market, because 
most of their customers are in another market, then why does it make sense for you to sign on to that? So again, this one size fits all mentality is just, it's not good for the space, first of all. And, and like you said, you know, I think both of you said like it, the, the collapsing is what's going to cause more problem, more more harm than good in the long well, run. It's just it's too much financial. It's way too much financial exposure. And one of the things I always think about with the all-in-one software, I'm always embarrassed to talk about it, but I'm, I'm this might be the first time. Is back in the day in 2011, I had accidentally bought a company that was a hyperlocal Groupon company. And the very first thing that I did was put it on a all-in-one software and competed with Groupon and Living Social, and we crushed them for a year and a half. But the problem is that the company, the technology company, didn't have enough funds, and they were going to go belly up. And I had to go find a seller who either already had their own software or I had to like give up the company. And it was either a reinvestment decision or what have you. It's like, there's too much exposure. And so what I think about is like going back to that hub and spoke model, it's, you know, when we talk about change management, like if you've ever changed from a property management system from one to another, it's bad. Your mm-hmm. team, they don't like it, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's like, think about th- the four tires on a car. I only want to change one tire at a time. I don't want all four tires to go <laughs> yeah, flat. Yeah, exactly. Right. And that's what this all-in-one approach is. And I just ultimately these people are seeing us as financial levers. It's been said that we are financial levers. And so how many more levers can they pull once they put you in there? Well, we can up a couple of points on your credit card process here, what have you. It's like, those are the things that make it really difficult for us as large management companies to move forward, I think. Yeah. And and I think, I mean, everybody should have the choice of whoever they want to do business with. I think one issue though, is that especially for these newer operators coming in, there's so much choice and they're, there is a lot of overlap between what a lot of these service providers actually provide as a service. And it can be really overwhelming. And, you know, I talk to many of them that are like, I've got this and this and this. I'm like, all three of those things do very similar that you definitely could eliminate at least one of them. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I think that that goes back to the education in our industry that you guys all know it exceptionally well, but not everybody does. And I think some of these companies are just making a lot of money off of the people that don't know any better. To kind of clarify a point, there is there is a place for all in one, right? Mm-hmm. I think my gripe is more along the lines of, you know, know what you're best best at in your own tech stack if you are mm-hmm. an all in one, and be reasonable with your bolt on tools. If your yeah. customer is not happy with the way that they're working, don't make them feel trapped in it. I mean, it's just it's just that simple. I think there there is a a place for an all in one. In a, in a company's development. Like I, when I started out and I had a lot less units at the time, LiveRes was a really good all-in-one yeah. system. It, it did what we needed it to do. We trusted the people that were kind of selecting the partnerships, not just that they were building everything in one environment. They were just being really selective about the companies that they connected to, yeah. right? And that's what created that ecosystem. So at the end of the day, what it ultimately boils down to is there is no one-size-fits-all you know, for any of us here, you know, on this call or in the environment. And I think that there's always the unintended consequences of good intentions. I think a lot of the the companies that went to build these all-in-ones had good intentions. Again, my gripe is when they start trying to trap you. Yeah. Yeah. And they trap, they try to trap you because the their overlords, their financial overlords, are saying you have to squeeze more out of these people. They're going to squeeze the people out, is what they're going right. to do, and yeah. create an opportunity for for others to get in. So that's just, I mean, it's just we should move on. But I mean, that's really happening as we speak. Oh, I, I hear that's it all the time. Yeah. So. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, uh, so let's let's do move on. Let's move on to something. Um, well, we you alluded to it. Like we don't know if there's going to be a DARM this year, but obviously we think we all want it. Everybody agrees it's one of the best conferences out there. Amy just does such a spectacular job in curating the content and 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 getting sessions put together and you know getting the right speakers. And so moving forward into this year, what conferences are you guys looking forward to besides DARM? And what do you think maybe we could add into? into the conference ecosystem. I mean, I think one of the things that we can all agree on is some of the stuff that's out there doesn't have any substantive depth to it. It's just like the same stuff regurgitated over and over. We're not getting anything new out of it. It's the same, you know, some of them are the same people on stage every time. What do you think we need to do as an industry to, I guess, mix it up and and maybe not have the sensationalism that kind of sits over on the STR side? Because I think there's a lot of 
pomp and circumstance and like showmanship that happens over there, which is great and it's fun. And I'm not saying there's not a place for it. I just think on our side, <laughs> our side of it, we want a little bit more button up, but maybe we do want to bring some of the fun showmanship into it. But uh, you guys are, uh, they're, you're veterans. You go to a lot of conferences. What do you think we could be doing differently? That's interesting because I think that what happens is, is like at the Vermas, I, that's why I really, really liked Darm was because the quality of the attendees um, that were at that conference. I've been to Verma. Um, it is such a wide range of levels of, of, of property managers that the classes didn't excite me. I didn't come home with a big list of takeaways of things that I could apply to the business to grow the business and make it better. I will not be in those conferences this year. Um, so I think DARM is probably the, the highest quality one and probably the only one that I will attend this year um, if it does happen um, because I just didn't get enough takeaways out of the others last year. All right. You guys ready? Yeah. <laughs> Travis is putting on All a right. conference. Yeah, the well, 100 collection retreat. <laughs> well, don't get me wrong. That's a fun summit. Um, that's <laughs> the, the partners. But Vacation World of Design Summit, uh, High Point, North Carolina. Oh, North Carolina, Carolina yeah. That's yeah. the first one. I think it's going to be fun. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. That's a different lens. NWVRP is always fun. Uh, great group of people. That's in Boise, Idaho, coming up at the end of April. BRMA Spring Summit in New Orleans. I think it'll be interesting to see how that goes. I, I do echo Julie's points where I just want professional content. That's what I love about DARM is the high level of content. It's I want to drink from a fire hose. And I, want to, I, I want to learn. I want big takeaways. Executive Summit, though. High quality people, a lot of fun. Um, I did just learn, I believe that Skift is putting on a, a conference or a short term rental summit. There's always some high level education there and interesting people. Yeah, they, are are they doing it in New York again? Is it New York again? I believe I just saw, I mean, I just literally uh, got an email about it today. I, did, I flagged it and sent it to the team. And then, of course, we have a, a 100 collection partner summit, which makes me <laughs> I have to talk. And all right, hey, you know. I'm going to Darm. <laughs> <laughs> I oh. just asked Amy. Hot on yeah. the press. Oh, oh. <laughs> the confirmation. When is it? All right. So hang on. There is a caveat. She is okay. working. She is working on the contract now. There will be a new location. I Ooh. asked her if I could share. She said yes. She said she's working on Tampa instead of Nashville. Oh, cool. Same time of year. I'm just December. down there. <laughs> uh, let's same time of year. Let's find nice. out. <laughs> I'll tell you what, what it is missing is any um, West Coast conferences. Uh, yeah, you guys kind of get cut out. We do. Yeah. Yeah. Hard. That's hard. That is hard. Well, I think that Cabo needs to host a conference for us to attend to. Maybe it's so you know what you know what conference I've heard is really good is Expo, Expo and Art, everybody yeah. keeps telling us that we need We're to go to that. I, I don't know if it's always in Cancun, but I know the last couple of years it has been. So yeah. that's on mm -hmm. my radar gonna, potentially. My, <laughs> so some of my favorites, I do like VRMA still from a from a like a grand scale like. I'm I'm a hallway guy there, right? I yeah, love mixing absolutely. and mingling there. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. And my team my team gets stuff when when they go from from the actual, you know, lectures or sponsored mm -hmm. promotions, whatever you want to call them. Um, Drinks. So you know, there, 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 there are there is some value there, but the most value comes from honestly the the smaller, more intimate uh, events that I've been to. Uh, a couple of Landau's events that I've been to were, were great. Um, and the, with, um, with Steve Schwab and then the Keystone events, those, mm -hmm. those were great. The uh, partner summit that I went to at the hundred collection was fantastic. I certainly hope you're going to do one of those again. Uh, Travis. Sounds like Julie's having us in Cabo. Is that, is that yeah. San Diego? <laughs> uh, you know, that's not a bad idea. I think Alex and Annie could be Julie's their just taking the cue. Yeah. <laughs> But I do, I that do really done. like, I do like the smaller, more intimate events. I think that those are really where you find the most traction. And a lot of times, you also see who the true sponsors of our of our industry are. Like the guys mm -hmm. that will come in and sponsor some of the smaller events, whether it's picking up dinners or just participating, you know, not being the salesy 
you know what I'm saying? Where it's here, I'm at a booth waiting for you to walk up, but they're actually absolutely yeah participating yeah. in the events. I think there's yeah. a great there's great value in that. It makes us still feel more cottage, right? This, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Not, you know, it, there is a time and a place for the big trade show expo style stuff, but I think a lot of a lot of the it's like when they say you know a lot of the business gets done on the golf course. The small mm-hmm. event is like the golf course for right. us. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Uh, I just saw my memories today that a year ago, right now, I know I was, Annie was, Travis, you were. I don't know CJ if you were there also. I know Julie, you were not, but we were in Kansas City Kansas this City, last yeah. year for Spring VRMA, yeah. and I, I will say, I mean, it, it was it was it was a cozy conference because <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot of people <laughs> just, there. No, it was uh, <laughs> not intentionally cozy, but um, but when I saw that, I'm like, gosh, no. I mean, that that was, and it, unfortunately, that was a, a rollover from. COVID that we had to have it that early, but, and in Kansas city, I mean, the venue was great and I think we all enjoyed ourselves, but um, the timing of the year for it was not good. VRMA spring this year is in new Orleans in April at a much better time of the year. And I think because of the location being so close to both the panhandle, other parts of Florida, Texas, um, there's, there's going to be a good crowd at that one, but maybe we should deter them if we like the (laughs) the smaller (laughs) setting. (laughs) <laughs> uh, it came to mind while you were talking. There was another, you know, event that I think is, is was pretty unique. At this last VRMA, Guesty had a side event, and it yeah. was not salesy. It was very educational, and it was a great networking event. Surprising enough, it wasn't all just Guesty users. There were a lot of other people there, and they were such good hosts. Like mm-hmm. the way that they catered the event and the format that they used was fantastic. I think there's a huge opportunity mm-hmm. in that regard as well. Like mm-hmm. yeah. in these, you know, Pre-conference. if we're going to continue to have exactly as an industry, this big mm-hmm. expo event, there's a huge untapped opportunity for that. Yeah. yeah. Right? Well, so. I know we're, um, we're getting t- close to time and I think we, we needed to wrap it up. Wanted to thank you guys for joining us. And I think we could have another conversation maybe in six months to see where Dooley, where your AI adaptive is gone and where the new key data dashboard is and whatever, Travis, are you demoing it? <laughs> whatever, whatever Travis <laughs> is doing. Are we trying to do whatever, whatever you've got testing <laughs> out there? Yeah, um, a couple of things. Yeah. We can revisit that. <laughs> uh, we I got one right behind time. me. <laughs> we'll put everybody's bios in the show notes and all of the information to reach out to you. But thank you guys so much for joining us. Anybody wants to get in touch with Alex and I, you can reach us at alexandanniepodcast.com or connect with us on LinkedIn and anywhere on our website. Did I miss anything? I'm, I'm not normally doing no, this. No, you that. This is the first. You did the closing. I love it. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for right, tuning thank in. Thank you. Good to see you guys. Bye. That was fun. Thank you. You guys are awesome.